Hi everyone, greetings again from a beautiful Ganubi. I just love this time of year, May, June, um, the autumn months, um, magnificent weather here on the east coast of South Africa. And of course the waves are good for surfing, um, the fish are biting, so all the things that I love in life are on the go and uh, I just enjoy it so much. But wherever you may be watching from around the world, welcome to you. And I love to hear from you. Um, it's always encouraging to receive feedback and notes from those you are watching. So if you're watching uh, from maybe somewhere other than South Africa, uh, just drop me a note there. Let me know where you're watching from. And even if you are South Africa and you find these broadcasts are being encouraging to you and helping you, uh, just drop a note there as well. I'd love to hear from you. Well, friends, today we're back into our series in the book of Revelation, and we're looking at chapters 17 and 18 today. Remember, we've said from the very beginning of the series that Revelation consists of a series of apocalyptic visions given to the Apostle John on the island of Patmos. And we've seen over the course of this series that there is way more going on in this world than initially meets the eye. We've been introduced to two polar opposite kingdoms in the spiritual realm. Um, the kingdom of light, ruled by Jesus and angels, and the kingdom of darkness, ruled by Satan and demons. And none of us, whether we are aware of it or not, are neutral spectators in this cosmic conflict. We're on one side or the other. We're going to see today that either we are citizens of Babylon and all that Babylon represents, or we are citizens of the New Jerusalem. And we need to be mindful, as it were, of where we've built our homes, where we've pitched our tents. Uh, this passage uses some really graphic language uh, on purpose, I think, because Jesus wants to he wants us to feel something deeply within our spirits. So with that said, let's turn in God's Word to Revelation chapter 17. If you've got your Bible available, uh, turn to Revelation chapter 17. And for time purposes, I'm just going to read the first seven verses, but I will reference as we go along to verses um, throughout chapter 17 and 18. So let's get God's Word open to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17, and let's pick it up there in verse 1. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled. Um, I was greatly astonished, the NIV puts it. When the angel said to me, Why are you marveling? Why are you astonished? I would explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. And friends, as I said, you can carry on reading for yourself the rest of chapter 17 and, of course, into chapter 18. But let's get started there in... Um, where we introduce to this great prostitute, um, some versions use the word the great harlot, who's sitting on the scarlet beast. Um, we know now from Revelation chapter 13, if we backtrack a little bit in the series, 
that the beast uh, is of course the Antichrist and all that the Antichrist represents the whole system he will lead during the Great Tribulation, um, a political social system that will draw people or seek to draw people away, uh, draw people's affection away from the worship of God. And so let's start out in uh, chapter 17 verse 5 where we read this, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, and of the abominations of the earth. Now, if you know your Bibles, you will know that word Babylon should already be ringing a bell somewhere. Because after the city of Jerusalem, Babylon is the city most mentioned in the Bible, but of course for all the wrong reasons. Babylon's history goes way back to Genesis chapter 11 when people constructed the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel. And remember, that's when people said, we don't need God to rule over us. And so they built this huge tower symbolizing the independence, um, symbolizing their rebellion against God and their determination to live life on their terms, to live life their way. And so the city of Babylon, you know, represents the city of man. It represents what humans can build in rebellion against God. It represents a way of life. It represents a system that exalts itself rather than submits to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Verse 2 describes Babylon as the great prostitute. And with her, we told the kings of the earth in verse 2 committed adultery. The inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. What a verse. The kings, leaders of nations, movers and shakers, influential people are drawn to this prostitute. Um, they commit adultery, spiritual adultery with her. Um, but also ordinary people are intoxicated by this woman. They're under her control and influence as they also commit spiritual adultery with her. So clearly she is not unattractive. She's charming. She's beautiful. Um, she's appealing. In fact, verse 4 describes her. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. Wow! So people look at her, they see her wealth, her opulence, her comfort, her sensual sexuality, and they conclude, wow, that's the good life over there. That's where I can find purpose and prosperity. That's where I can find happiness and success. That's where I can find comfort. That's where I can live my best life now. And they are drawn to her. They are captivated her uh, by her like a moth is drawn to a light. Even the word harlot or prostitute is meant to um, evoke a feeling of seduction. Uh, she's seducing people. She's drawing people to herself. And we told you in verse 6 of our text that even John the Apostle initially was astonished. He, he marveled when he first saw this woman. Such was her initial attraction and beauty. Verse 6, when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Clearly John couldn't quite make sense of what he was seeing. And the angel comes to John in verse 7 and says, John, why are you astonished? Why are you marveling at this woman? Let me tell you who she really is. She's a seductress. And friends, this is a warning to the church that we need to heed right here and now. Babylon is constantly calling us. This is the way to life. This is the path to significance and success. This is where you'll be free. This is where you'll be comfortable and happy and wealthy and secure. And scripture is warning us, watch out for her. She's prettier. She is more attractive than you think she is. And you give her an opportunity and she will seduce you and she will draw you away from the worship of Jesus. In the words of author and Bible commentator George Eldon Ladd, he says the main thought 
is that with the promise of wealth and comfort, the woman entices men away from the worship of God. Exactly what I've just said, entices, seduces people with the promise of wealth and comfort, draws them away from the worship of God. Friends, don't be deceived. Don't be misled. This game of seduction is a dangerous game and it ends in destruction. And it's happening over and over again all over the world. In fact, it's happening before our very eyes. Seduction leading to destruction. There's a brilliant book called Worldliness written by C.J. Mahoney. I recommend you get a, your hands on that book if you can. Um, but here's a quote from that book. C.J. writes, Today, the greatest challenge facing Christians in the West is not persecution from the world, but seduction by the world. Not persecution from the world in the West, but seduction by the world. I love the words of Charles Spurgeon. Listen to what he says. He says, I believe that one reason why the church of God has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. Thought provoking words. People are being seduced. People are being deceived by the promise of finding purpose and meaning and satisfaction and significance outside or apart from Jesus. And friends, it is all an illusion. There is only one who created you. There is only one who knows you better than you know yourself. There is only one who has a plan and a purpose for your life. There is only one who offers you rivers of living water. There is only one who is able to satisfy the deepest longings of your soul. And his name is Jesus. Unlike Jesus, who always tells the truth, the woman or Babylon makes promises she cannot keep. What about the promise of satisfaction? Have you ever thought, once I get that, and you can fill in the blank, once I get that job, once I get that promotion, once I get that relationship, once I get that, uh, I'll be happy, I'll be content, I'll be successful. The promise of satisfaction. What about the promise of security? Look how the prostitute describes herself in chapter 18, verse 7. In her heart she boasts, saying, I sit enthroned as a queen. I'm no widow, and I will never see sorrow. Wow. Just, just follow me. Just buy into my worldview. Just, just buy into my philosophy of materialism and comfort. And you'll be safe. You'll be secure. And friends, again, it's all an illusion. Um, I receive messages um, from, from people, the spouses of wealthy, wealthy people, who say their husband or their wife is, is riddled with anxiety and fear every time the stock markets jitter. They are not safe. They are not secure. The promise is just an illusion. Remember the attitude of the church in Laodicea. And I've just had a, the privilege of leading a group of people to the site of that church in Revelation chapter 3. But remember how that church described themselves. They said, we are rich. We have become wealthy and have need of nothing. Wow. You see, Laodicea was a wealthy city, famous for black wool, famous for its clothing industry, famous for its medical uh, center for eye treatment. And like many people today, the Laodiceans were absolutely oblivious. They were deceived as to the real condition of their hearts. Blinded by the hope of security in this world, we lack for nothing because we've got stuff. Well, look how Jesus describes them. <laughs> Imagine receiving these words from Jesus. He says, you do not realize, Laodiceans, that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Wow. Friends, 
the highest level of deception is self-deception where somehow you've convinced yourself that your life is okay and it's okay to have some of Babylon and some of Jesus at the same time. Remember the rich young ruler, the parable that Jesus told? Here was a man completely seduced by the spirit of Babylon. I'll pull down my barns and I'll build bigger ones, he said, and then I'll sit back and I'll enjoy the good life. I'll eat, drink and be merry. Jesus says, you fool, you fool. This very night your soul will be demanded of you and what will become of all you have built? Friends, at the heart of all these issues is one word that begins with a P, and that is P-R-I-D-E, pride. And it's pride that dominates these two chapters of Revelation. I mean, just think about the wording. I sit enthroned as a queen, not just a prostitute, but the great prostitute, not just Babylon, but Babylon the great. The root of all these issues is pride. We've made ourselves number one and we live in a world and we live in a system that is constantly appealing to this root issue of pride. And you know what, friends, it's nothing new. You go back into the Old Testament and you think about Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. <laughs> Listen to his words of pride and arrogance. Is this not the great Babylon that I have built by my mighty power for the glory of my majesty? In other words, look at me, everyone. I'm powerful. I'm successful. I'm great. And I've got the stuff to prove it. Well, the words were barely out of Nebuchadnezzar's mouth and he was out in the fields living like a wild animal, eating the grass of the fields, having lost his mind. And that leads me to our final point, And that is that Babylon is headed for a definite conclusion. Have a look at chapter 18, verse 2. Prophetic words. Fallen. Fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons and a horn for every unclean spirit. Friends, Babylon is headed for a definite conclusion. It is guaranteed that everything you see standing, all these things that look so appealing, so amazing, so attractive, they will not last. And it will happen suddenly. It will happen quickly. Verse 16 and 17. Listen to these words. Woe, woe to you, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. In one hour, it will disappear. It will be obliterated suddenly, unexpectedly, and quickly. And look how it happens in our text. This is incredible. Verse 16 of chapter 17. <coughs> the beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Friends, what a verse is that? The beast we know from earlier in the series is the Antichrist. And the ten horns are the, the end time coalition of nations, this international coalition that is assembled. And they end up turning on the prostitute and destroying her. Friends, listen carefully. Our enemy is so cunning and deceptive. If he were to come out right to you and say, come with me. I want to destroy your marriage. I want to destroy your family. I want to destroy your future. I want to get you depressed. I want to get you anxious. I want to get you addicted. I want to see you drowning in materialism and debt. You want to come with me? Friends, I'm guessing none of us would say yes to that invitation. Yes, that sounds like the dream I had for my life. But how many of us end up there? It's deception. 
It's smoke and mirrors. You see, she keeps throwing out bait. The bait of comfort, the bait of pleasure, the bait of wealth, the bait of autonomy that looks and sounds so attractive. But if you take that bait, it'll turn on you and it will eventually destroy you. So friends, as we wrap it up then, how should we respond? Have a look at verse 4 and 5 of chapter 18. How should we respond? <coughs> then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. The message is loud and clear. My people, come out. Come out of Babylon. This is a call to upside down countercultural living. This is a call to a lifestyle that is opposite to that of Babylon. Friends, as Christ followers in these critical days, we are not called to blend in. We are called to stand out. We are not called to be cool. We are called to the cross and all that the cross stands for. And I believe one of the key differences we'll manifest as followers of Jesus in these days is peace. No matter what's going on around us, as the uncertainty and chaos of the world increases, we're going to walk and live in the peace of God. Because we know that our lives and our futures belong to Him. <coughs> Another key difference is that we reject the consumption, the, the consumer mentality of Babylon that says, I always need more to be happy. No, rather than consumption, we live with a spirit of radical generosity. I'm going to use my money. I'm going to use my time. I'm going to use my gifts. I'm going to use my home. In fact, I'm going to use my life to invest in kingdom extending, God glorifying projects that extend the reign and rule of Jesus. So let's finish up with verse 14 of chapter 17 and what a verse of victory it is. Are you ready? They will wage war against the Lamb. Of course, we know the Lamb to be Jesus, but the Lamb will triumph over them because He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And with Him will be His called, His chosen and His faithful followers. Friends, we know that He is good, He is faithful, His ways lead to life. And we know the end of the story has already been written. Jesus Christ is victorious. And we are victorious in Him. May those words fill your hearts with faith and hope. And let's go and live in the power of Jesus. And let's go and live upside down, counter-cultural lives that point people to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. And we'll see you next week again.